Uh, my name is Lindsay Sheridan and I'm the Parliamentary Officer at Results Canada. Uh, prior to working at Results, I was a staffer on Parliament Hill. I currently reside in Ottawa and I'm on the unceded, unceded Algonquin Anishinaabek Traditional Territory. And for those of you who don't necessarily know Results, we're an NGO advocacy organization with a mission and goal to end extreme poverty. And then so I'll hand it over to Ohenia to briefly introduce OCIC. Thanks, Lindsay. Uh, so as was said, my name is Ohenia. I'm a community engagement specialist with OCIC and we're based in Toronto, which is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Métis and the Mississaugas of the new credit First Nation. Um, and if you haven't come across OCIC, we are a network of over 100 organizations, institutions, and people working for sustainable development. And uh, part of what we like to do is engage in dialogue around um, sustainable development issues. And this advocacy space um, is one where we'd love our community to be more um, engaged in. So we're super happy to be working with Results to deliver this uh, bootcamp for you. So uh, I'll pass it on to Lindsay. Yeah, and we're just as excited to participate because advocating is a really important skill and you can basically do it at any level of government, which we'll be going through shortly today. So before we jump in, I just wanted to outline some of the housekeeping rules. Just so everyone knows, this webinar will be recorded and sent to all registrants. Please keep yourself muted so everyone can hear properly. We will have a designated question and answer period. However, if you do have a question, don't be afraid to use the raise hand icon in the chat function or write your question in the chat box and we'll try to answer. We do have a Google Doc that is being sent around that has some of these questions and so I'm happy to answer them on that forum as well. And just as always, if you're comfortable and able, turn your video on because it's always nice to see everyone's faces. So we're on week three, the halfway point. We're gonna be discussing who's got the power, the ins and outs of parliamentary advocacy. Upcoming, we have a really exciting webinar, Advocacy in the Digital Age, which I think is especially relevant given COVID-19, we're all virtually online. And then finally, we're gonna be ending off with tracking progress and looking at the best practices in m &E. So those are gonna be two really important webinars and I hope you, we see you guys there for those two as well. So my objective, objective today for this webinar is to leave you with a clear understanding of parliamentary procedure, which will help inform your engagement. I also hope to provide some important considerations, tactics and questions to help you think through when you're building a strategy and then give some resources and tools so you can communicate successfully with parliamentarians. And so to do that today, we will be going through the agenda quickly. So obviously we're gonna do our normal check-in and icebreaker where we'll break out into breakout rooms and have you have a discussion with everybody to build community. Then we're gonna go right into what is parliamentary advocacy and kind of have a discussion and activity on the various levels of government in Canada. From there, we'll look at uh, a government breakdown. So who are the players and who's who? And this will involve looking into parliamentary procedure and different roles in the government. Uh, we'll then look into strategy, so some of the tools and rules, and I'll share some tactics, go over some communication tips, how to answer tough questions, and if we have time, I'll dive into a case study. Uh, I'm very excited to also share that we have a guest parliamentarian joining us at the end. Uh, they're going to be in a committee during the time, so they'll be hopping out of that to join us. So we're very excited to have that at the end, but just remember the time will be limited, and we hope that everyone can stay on to uh, communicate after that. So if everybody's ready, and I think we're a little bit early this time, we can dive right into our icebreaker for the day. And so the question you're gonna be asked in your groups that you'll all hopefully be able to respond to is who is your MP and have you ever engaged with them? If you have and you're comfortable to share what kind of engagement you did, and if you haven't engaged, why haven't you? What has been holding you back? And that could be anything. If you are international, you can just explain some of the things that happen in your own country. Um, so first off, I just wanted to kind of bring everybody back and recap what advocacy is. So in the first webinar series, Taryn explained what advocacy is. So it's conducting actions to influence decision makers to bring about specific changes. And so when we're talking about parliamentary advocacy, we're going to be focusing on the federal level today because within the lens of the sustainable development goals, the federal level has the jurisdiction to speak on international matters. That isn't to say that you can't advocate at the other levels, and I will go over the other levels of government to kind of clarify some of those questions. But for today's purposes, parliamentary advocacy is defined as conducting actions aimed to influence elected officials at the federal level of government to bring about specific changes. 
So that's what we mean when we talk about generating the political will. So in our case, we try to generate the political will to end extreme poverty. And so we advocate to members of parliament and senators to try to make them kind of take up the cause and work with us to try to uh, bring about those changes. And so now I'm going to just go into the breakdown of government because it is really important. Canada does have three different levels of government, as you can see in this slide here. And you can advocate at every level, but the important is knowing which level of government works on what issues. And so that's what I'm just going to go about shortly here, quickly, and then we'll have a little activity after. So make sure you're paying attention. So at the very bottom of this slide, we have the municipal level of government. The mayor is elected here and there, the head of power at this level. Under the mayor, we have city councillors who are also elected. Uh, city councillors sometimes go under party names, but most often in communities, they run without a party backing them. So that's an important thing to note at the municipal level. Uh, the municipalities get power from the provincial body and they're responsible for policies and programs that relate specifically to their unique community needs. So examples such as garbage disposal, the local police department or parking are all gonna be under the municipal level of power. So moving up, we have provincial and territorial, this level of government. And so this is where you'll hear MPP because we have the premier who is elected official in Ontario, we have premier Doug Ford currently right now. And so under Doug Ford, we have uh, members of the provincial parliament, so MPPs. They can also be called members of the legislative assembly. They're also known in other places as members of the national assembly or members of the house assembly. So these are all, all names that represent the elected officials under the premier who work in the municipal or the federal and provincial government. Sorry about that. And so at this level of government uh, is responsible for issues and challenges that are facing the unique needs of the province and territory. So anything that addresses the needs of the province. And this is important because territories are gonna have extremely dif big differences based on their community, their rural population, who's in charge versus municipalities who might have different needs. And obviously at the provincial level, uh, the territories are going to be much different from British Columbia. British Columbia is going to be much different from Ontario. And so some of the things that provincial and provinces and territories are responsible for are things such as uh, highways or driver's licenses. So that's something important to note as well. Moving up the ladder at the top level, we have the federal government, which is the prime minister. Uh, he is elected or she gets elected and gets their uh, power from everybody in Canada. They create laws and policies that manage programs and services that affect the whole country or, of, or of, of international concern. So here we're talking about things like armed forces, criminal law, or fisheries and oceans. And so under the Prime Minister, we have 338 members of Parliament, so MPs who are elected across Canada in their constituencies and ridings. And then we have 105 senators. So senators are slightly different. They're appointed by the governor general from advice from the prime minister who's in power. Uh, they're appointed to a term up to retirement essentially. So they're in power for a much longer time. This is important because you can build relationships with senators because you know that they will be there long term. Every bill must pass through the Senate. So they also gain power from that sense. They can also book rooms, uh, publish material and coordinate amongst themselves. And so, at the federal level, things like I said before, armed forces, criminal law, fisheries and oceans. Another really important thing to note is that oftentimes indigenous services are exclusively dealt with by the federal government because the complex historical relationship with First, First Nations, Métis and Inuit people. So I hope everybody had a pretty good understanding of that. And now we're gonna go to an activity. So if you see on the screen here, I'm asking you all to match the responsibility with the correct level of government. So I'm gonna open the poll, a polling feature up that will pop onto your screen and you're gonna to have to answer whether public transit fits under which level of government. So just give me a second to bear with me and we'll see if we can get this going right now. So hopefully this pops up on everybody's screen. Does everybody see that? And so if you're comfortable, please uh, go through the poll polling now.
And so I'm just going to give it a couple more seconds. Okay, so it looks like we are almost done. And so I'm going to end the polling now. Okay, everybody. So get your answers in now. Okay. So can everybody see me sharing the results here on the screen? Okay, so let's look into some of these answers and we can talk this through. So what level of government is responsible for public transit? And 72% of you said municipal, which is the right level of government. Uh, because transportation needs vary versus community, whether you live in a really rural community or versus, let's say, a very urban community, that's going to change your transportation needs. So even here in Ottawa, we're dealing with the LRT, a light rail system, system and Mayor Watson has been getting into some trouble in the media because it's not operating properly. So if we move into question number two, what level of government is responsible for hospitals? Again, 80% of you guessed right or knew the answer. This is going to be provincial government. And just like before, uh, each province will have different needs based on their hospitals and based on the population size. And so they're responsible for governing uh, the hospitals. So what level of government is responsible for immigration? 85 of you were right. It's the federal level of government. Immigration is uh, a national issue as people are coming in from different countries. And so this is regulated by the federal government. So moving down to education, again, 80% of you guessed correctly, provincial government is right. I think it's really interesting to see right now with COVID, each province is trying to decide when the best time to open their schools is. So it's an interesting kind of conversation to see live. And then finally, what level of government is responsible for foreign affairs? And 96% of you said international, and that is the correct answer. So, just going to move on to our next slide. And so why will we be focusing specifically on federal parliamentary advocacy? And just to go over, the, this level, like I said, is the only level that has an international mandate. So MPs and senators are the only ones who can speak to these issues. Uh, then budget consultation. So the federal government decides the budget for the whole country. And so there are points you can do here to influence that policy, to make different, um, I guess, make different priorities for the government to focus on. So being present and uh, contributing to the budget consultation is a huge way. It's also the place where funding mechanisms are happen. So the official development assistance bundle, which is the main uh, funding envelope for international development comes at the federal level through this funding mechanism. It's also where multi multilateral relationships are formed. So Canada's federal level of government deals with like the United Nations and other organizations as such. And then uh, national legislation is passed here and at the international level, the federal government is supposed to represent the Canadian voice abroad. So that's something else to keep in mind. And so before I go into the breakdown of the federal government, I want to make something kind of known and clear. Uh, it's important to note these differences. They're very small, but they actually mean uh, two different things. So parliament encompasses all MPs and senators. So when I'm talking about parliament, I'm talking about everybody. If I say government, the government of the day you often hear is who is in power at that time. So the government of the day right now is the Liberals. And so they are the governing power in Canada. So I just want to make sure that's clear. Parliament is everybody. When I say government, it's who's in power, who has the most seats in the House of Commons, essentially. And so right now, it's kind of interesting. These are the main parties in Canada, and by main, it's basically all of them. Uh, it's really interesting because we're in a minority government currently, which means that the Liberals hold the majority of the seats but they can't pass bills through without getting support from other parties. So they need to collaborate and work together more to pass bills. And so this is also interesting because if all the other parties join together to pass a bill or defeat a bill, they actually have the power. So right now the Liberal government holds 157 seats, the Conservatives have 121, the Bloc Québécois have 32, and the NDP have 24. 
the green had three and we had one independent jody the honorable jody whistling raybould won her seat back in this election so last week the question was should you work with all parties and my honest opinion is absolutely you should you have to do your historical homework and read into what they support or don't support previously what their party platforms have said but i think it's really important to remember that not everybody in the party thinks like the party leader so if the party leader is saying something that might be controversial or doesn't necessarily kind of mesh with what your organization or personal goals are it doesn't mean that every single mp in the party agrees with them and we've actually had personal experience where the part leader of a party has come out and said stuff but then members in the party have said um, that they kind of disagree and they are supportive. So it's, a, it's an important dynamic to think through, uh, but I definitely think you should work with all parties because you never know who an unusual suspect might be or who actually supports the causes of change you wanna see in the world. And again, make sure you do your historical homework ahead of time, kind of see what the party has done when they're in power, what they vote for, what they don't vote for. And so now we're just gonna look into the government. So again, like I mentioned, the government in power is the Liberal government. At the top of this level of government, we have the Prime Minister, who's the leader of the party in power and is considered the head of the government. Below him, we have Cabinet, which is comprised of ministers. Currently, the Canadian government has 35 ministers. They're chosen by the MP at the start of Parliament. They meet regularly and they're in charge of departments. So if you see in this picture, we have Bill Morneau right in front. And so he is the Minister of Finance and also the head of the Department of Finance and the Ministry of Finance. So they hold these, uh, they hold these departments. And so they're the ones to talk to if you're focused on something specific. So if you want to do international development, the Minister for International Development currently is Karina Gold. And so you would go to her. Uh, and again, they just meet regularly and they're kind of the inner circle around the prime minister. Below the cabinet and the ministers, which a lot of people don't necessarily know, there's some, a position called a parliamentary secretary. So you can think of parliamentary secretaries as kind of assistants to the ministers. So they help the ministers answer questions, participate, participate in debates, they speak to government policies and proposals, and they're the link between parliamentarians and ministers. So each minister in the cabinet has a parliamentary secretary under them who's there in case they can't always uh, be at a certain event or be in the House of Commons debating, debating issues. So if Karina Gold isn't possible to get at an event or a reception, someone just as powerful would be the uh, parliamentary secretary, Kamal Kara. But it's also important to remember that if you're trying to engage with the minister, the parliamentary secretary could be someone who can help influence or change a decision. So you can also reach out to them. After that, we have chairs of committees. Uh, in most committees, the chair is a liberal because the committees represent the seats in the House of Commons within the committee. There are committees that come up afterwards or are created, and in some committees, they do elect their own chair, but it's just something to note as well. And beneath that, we have all members of the party. So moving on to the opposition. So the role of the opposition is to challenge the government policies and to hold the government account for its actions. So I've identified gaps in different bills to have new suggestions. And it's also to give the voters an alternative to the government in power. And so I just wanted to explain, we have the cabinet comprised of the ministers on the government side, and then the opposition has its own type of system to keep the government to account. So the official opposition currently is the conservative government. And so within the conservative government, there's a shadow cabinet. So the ca shadow cabinet is comprised of MPs who are supposed to hold the minister particularly to account and they also field questions from the party from constituents on that certain issue. So the international development shadow minister is MP Mike Lake and so if any members or constituents have an issue related to international development that maybe the government is missing, uh, Mike Lake is, could be a person who will challenge that in the House of Commons. The NDP called them critics and the Bloc called them shadow cabinet or deputies. So other important positions that I just wanna make sure everybody has an understanding of are house leaders. So house leaders are not the same as party leaders. House leaders meet regularly to discuss upcoming business in the house. So they talk about how long bills will be debated for and they go through special issues that are to be discussed. And then the whip. So the whip, each party has a whip 
and the whip ensures that every party has enough members to vote. So if there's a vote that gets pushed through, obviously things have changed because COVID-19 right now, but it's important to note that like as this is happening, parliament is trying to transition to unique ways. But so the RIPs, whip's general role is to ensure that there's enough people to make votes and also they determine committee positions. Finally, we have the Speaker of the House. So they're elected by secret ballot at the start of every new parliament. They preside over the House of Commons so that everybody respects the rules and traditions. They must remain impartial and apply the rules to everyone equally. And I like to kind of think of them as a referee because it can be a little bit crazy in the House at times. So the Speaker of the House is the one to remind members to stay calm, relax, and don't heckle. So in this picture, if you can see my cursor, this chair at the front is where the Speaker of the House will sit. The uh, governing um, government in power, so the Liberals will sit on one side, and then the oppositions will sit on other. And this is how they discuss different things. So there, a procedure in the House of Commons is question period. So in question period, MPs stand in the House and they ask questions to different ministers, to committee chairs. And so they're asking questions on new policies, trying to understand services, what, if there's new bills coming, facts about the bills, and maybe also asking questions on government spending. At the beginning of the, of the House of Commons proceedings, there's also a space for statements. So uh, MPs have time to stand up and make a statement, which is a little bit longer. And so they are able to address major policy actions, update from concerns from their constituents, or talk about maybe things that are uh, related to what other parliamentarians are doing in regards to bills um, and uh, different services. So finally, again, talking going back to committees, committees meet to look at bills in greater detail. So if a bill is brought to the House, it's debated, and then they vote on it, then it gets sent to committee to be uh, looked into much further and to have research done to make sure they're not missing any, any information. Then it goes back to the House of Commons to be debated and then voted on. And if it's successful there, it goes to the Senate and goes through the same process. So another important and different aspect of engagement that a lot of people don't realize is that there are interparliamentary friendship groups and associations as well. So these groups don't get financial support from parliament, but they provide the space for MPs to explore other interests. So for example, there's an inter-parliamentary group called the Canada Africa Association, and it's for MPs who are interested in the relationship between Canada and Africa, and it provides the space to engage with different parliaments. Another term that people might not realize is the word caucus. So caucus basically is a word that describes all the MPs comprised in a party. And so caucus meets every Wednesday morning, pre-COVID, and they help determine their party's policy and their parliamentary strategy moving forward. So I know that was a lot and there'll be room for questions in one second, but we're gonna have another polling game. And so right now we're gonna see how well everybody knows the 43rd parliament. So on the screen here, I have five different parliamentarians and I'm gonna put the polling feature up and it's gonna give you a list of names and you're gonna try to correctly identify the MPs in the picture. Okay, so it started now. I'm gonna give about three to four minutes for this and then we're gonna look through it again. This one is a little bit trickier. I think it's a really important practice to kind of have a visual understanding of who at least your MP is. So if you do see them out and about, you can say hello, you can mention your constituents, but also you can see them at airports, bus stations, train stations, and you never know when you could advocate so it's always great to kind of have a visual understanding of who these MPs are. So, so far we have 11 people out of 52 who are voting. So I just encourage everyone to vote so we can see how well you all know the 43rd parliament. So I'm just going to give it about a couple more minutes. I'm just looking at the chat right now. And so just answering this question, 
you definitely can reach out to any minister or MP, especially ministers, as they're in charge of a whole department. And so if your issue is related to that department, absolutely, you can reach out to the minister or even the parliamentary secretary. The reason why reaching out to your MP from your constituency is a good idea is because they work for, like, they work for you, essentially, and their whole job and responsibility is to listen to the needs of their constituency and community. And again, if anybody has any questions about parliamentary procedure on the worksheet, there will be more information on it. So make sure you check that out. I tried to provide the things that I thought were probably the most important for advocacy and where to start when you're thinking about who you should engage with. But again, there's a wealth of information out there. So don't be afraid to, to dive in or ask any more questions. Okay, so I'm going to end the polling now. And we'll go over the results. So can everybody see me? Sh oh, there we go. Sharing the results. So the parliamentarian in photo number one, 79% guessed right. So this is the Honorable Minister Karina Gold. She is the Minister of International Development. And so she is the head of that department and she is the voice in cabinet on anything related to international development. So moving on to parliamentarian two, 90% uh, of you guessed it. This is the Honorable Party Leader Andrew Scheer of the Conservatives. He, they are uh, doing another party election coming up in a couple of months. So it'll be interesting to see who the Conservatives elect now as their party leader. Moving down the line, this is where it gets a little bit trickier. The parliamentarian in photo three. So 40% of you, not as much, guessed correctly. Leah Ga MP Leah Gaslin was right behind. So very interesting. But the MP in this photo is MP Heather McPherson. She is actually the critic for international development from the NDP. And she used to be the executive director of the Alberta Council for International Cooperation. So an interesting connection there. So the parliamentarian in photo four, 67% guessed right. This is MP Yves Francois Blanchet. He is the party leader of the Bloc Québécois. And a lot of people give him a lot of credit for the huge amount of success the Bloc Québécois had in Quebec this year because he's very charismatic and did well in the debates. Um, so parliamentarian number five, this one seems to have the most, um, this seems to have the most kind of sway in the amounts. So 43% of you actually guessed MP Sona Sidhu, and that is incorrect. Those of you who guessed MP Kamal Kara were right at 33%, and Kamal Kara is actually the parliamentary secretary for international development. So if Karina Gold is not necessarily available, MP Kamal Kara will be there to take anything up. So that was a really great exercise and I'm really glad that uh, everybody participated. So I just wanted to time to take a break and this is gonna be the time to ask any questions. So uh, if you wanna raise your hand or put in the chat box or have any questions, this will be the time to go to the washroom or to grab a drink or just stretch a little bit. But I wanted to open up to some questions before we kind of get into the strategy engagement part of the webinar. So feel free to ask any questions uh, through video or in chat. And then in about three minutes, we will go back and I'll go over some of the strategy involved. I'm just looking over some of the questions that were in the chat. Luckily, my amazing colleagues have been answering them as we go. So thank you for that. It would be funny if they had hockey cards. That would be a great idea. I think more people would be willing to engage. So good, good one, Chris. But if, if anybody has any questions, though, or has a comment or wants to add anything, Now's the time. If not, we will move forward. Okay, great. So I'm just going to move along here then. And again, feel free to answer more questions in the chat throughout. So now we're just going to touch base on some of the strategy and tools and rules. So I want to make it very clear that you can follow these, whether you're advocating at, as an individual for a specific change you personally want to see as an organization, or maybe just as a group of friends who are really 
uh, really want to make sure that climate change doesn't affect us all, which is part of the sustainable development goals as well. So these kind of tips and tricks I'm just laying out here are some of the things that I think everybody should kind of think of through when they are doing an engagement strategy. So the first thing you always want to make sure is you understand what your end goal is, what you're hoping to achieve by engaging with parliamentarians and what you're trying to ultimately bring about change for. So you really want to make sure that's clear. And as Kenneth and Robin chatted last week, that is the ask essentially. After you've kind of got that very clear in your mind, you want to start to map the levels of power and influence. So who are the decision makers? Who are the influencers? And who are the targets? And so when we're talking about parliamentary engagement, let's say with an organization, you have to decide, are you going to try to target a lot of people to build a movement to show that a lot of MP support is around one issue? Are you going to target specifically maybe the minister, the top level of power at that decision making under the minister? Are you going to immediately try to engage with them? Are you going to try to ask critics to get involved by making questions and question period to bring up issues? And so these are kind of the things you want to think through when you're mapping the power, levels of power influence. If you're an individual, maybe you see that the minister said something that necessarily that has like a gap or there's something missing in a statement they're making. And so then you can maybe go to a critic and ask them to bring up this issue. And so you can advocate individually and collectively. So I want to make sure that it's very clear. The most important, in my opinion, thing to do when engaging with a parliamentarian is to do your research. And so there's a bunch of different ways that I like to do this, and I'm going to explain you, them to you because I think it's really, really important. So I always like to start off by going to the House of Commons website. So this will be in your worksheet as well, this link, but essentially I'll just type in the MP's name and then Commons in Google. And so this will bring up a picture and it'll show all of their roles in the government, including committees, parliamentary groups, if they're a house leader, if they're a whip. And you can also see if they've been in a different parliament. So if they were elected before this term, you can see the previous roles that they've been on. And this is helpful because maybe this term, your MP is on like the library committee, but last term they were on foreign affairs. So foreign affairs, they might know some things about international development or the sustainable development goals. So it's always good to check that first. Then I go onto their party website. I read their bios. Oftentimes in their bios, they have information on uh, where they volunteered, if they're a board member or on anything, if they have a passion in their community. And it kind of gives you a sense of what the MP is looking to do in their term with their priorities. Then I also like to creep their social media just to see, one, how often do they engage? Does it seem like a staffer is on their accounts? Are they only retweeting like stuff that their party lead leaders are putting forward? Are they themselves tweeting? And so it's really interesting to see the level of engagement here. Uh, and then I like to do wik Wikipedia. I know it's a little bit unorthodox, but the party website and their social media are only what the MP wants you to see. So they're gonna put forward whatever you wanna see. So I always like to check media, uh, Wikipedia and then do a wide news story search to see if the MP was involved in maybe any controversial or if they've had something come up like a matter if they've had a health issue or anything like that because it's really important to note. Uh, the second and last thing I like to do when I'm doing this is Open Parliament which is another website. They have a feature where you can follow what your MP is doing so you can sign up for a newsletter and it'll send you a little uh, kind of newsletter with any information about your MP. So if they talked in question period or if they were involved in a committee, it'll send you a transcript of what they've been involved with. So that's a really useful tool. So moving onwards, the next thing I always like to do, and I think it's really important, is to always go back to your wider advocacy strategy. So even though parliamentary advocacy is a huge role in this, you also want to see what else is going on. So maybe there's a particular date that you have in your head. Maybe it's a World Population Day or World Celebrate like the Environment Day. And so you want to make sure you're checking kind of those things so that they line up with what your strategy is for parliamentary engagement. And again, you want to consult this uh, SMART goals acronym because you want to make sure that your engagement is specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and timed as well. So then we dive into tactics. So how to frame your messaging. And this is also extremely important because after you've done your research, maybe you found that your MP is, uh, was on the finance committee. Previously, they worked in the financial sector. And so they'll probably be very driven and want to know all about the economics of the issue you're talking to. 
So your research will help inform your messaging. Maybe there's a different MP who's really passionate about women and girls' rights. And so you'll change your messaging around to kind of uh, make it fit for that person that you're meeting. And so that's really helpful because it, you can also kind of think through what they might ask you and it'll help you plan ahead for any kind of engagement that you're doing. Then you also need to have information and research that'll help you make a compelling case. So you need to back up your passion and your enthusiasm with hard evidence and research as to why it matters and to why it's important. And you want to make sure it's reliable and up to date. And then finally, you're going to decide how to communicate. So once you've kind of thought through all of these things, you want to make sure that you're communicating and you can communicate in so many different ways. So before COVID-19, you could send a letter free of postage to any MP's office that was suspended briefly because deliveries were diverted to deal with the pandemic. However, I have been reading a lot of articles in Intel about um, how they're really trying to get this back on because a lot of people have different levels and access to technology. And so letter writing is really important to a lot of different populations. Uh, second, you can email them. So just send them an email introducing yourself, introducing the issue that you care about and you're trying to see change for. If you're comfortable, you can try to give them a phone call. You can attend uh, a virtual reception. So a lot of MPs are thinking of doing virtual town halls or maybe they're live on Facebook. And so by attending that, it gives you exposure saying that you're following them. And it also lets you see how they interact in public and what their talking points are. So receptions are also a good way to kind of feel the MP out. You can engage on social media, which I know Lisa and Emma are going to dive into next week, but possibly just tagging your MP in a question, even just starting to follow them to see what they're posting. So that's also very helpful. And then finally, one of the things that I think is the most important and the most effective is having meetings. Obviously now they'll have to be virtual. Results Canada has had has had success having virtual meetings and phone calls recently. And so I think it's really important to continue to try to engage with these virtual meetings because it's the best way to meet your MP and also kind of have this back and forth where you're face to face in a way and can watch their mannerisms and just be very engaged. And so I just wanted to go over some little rules I think are important when you're doing meetings. So you're going to request your meeting via email, obviously. If you are a constituent, you always want to introduce yourself as a constituent so the MP knows that you vote in their riding. You don't want to overwhelm them and use really difficult jargon. You want to use plain language that helps explain your issue. You don't know the levels of knowledge an MP might have on something, so it's important to make sure it's very specific, concise, and in plain language. Then if you're having a really good conversation, you're gonna follow up with the action that, they, that you want them to take. And hopefully after you've had a great conversation and you've, had a comp you've made the compelling case that they will take that action on for you. So they'll agree to take action for you. So you always wanna take a photo. This is great because you can follow up on social media, tag your MP and show that you met with them. It's also a good way to have exposure. The other important thing, and as a staffer, I think it's one of the most important things is you wanna uh, stay super close to the MP staffer. They are essentially the gatekeeper for the whole office and operation. And they're in charge of uh, the day-to-day -day behind the scenes things that go around in the MP's offices. MPs are extremely busy. So often it's the staffers who are making decisions about their schedule, their appointments, and who they're gonna be involved with. So always try to make sure to get a staffer email if you can. And then finally, you want to engage with your MP beyond the meeting. So you want to make sure that you're chatting with them. Uh, and this is the question I think is always asked of how often. You don't want to be uh, necessarily um, annoying, I guess is the best way to put that. So you don't want to message them every single day. But a great way to, is to always follow up after your email with a thank you email. So say thank you right after you've had a meeting. Maybe provide some extra information. Uh, follow up with the action. So if you're asking them to do something, put an accountability mechanism in place, ask them to send you a letter if that's what you did, um, ask them to be on social media. So just follow up and make sure and that'll kind of help engage with your MP beyond the meeting. So like I said, maybe it's attending a virtual hall, maybe it's liking a post on their social media, just to make sure that they know that you're following and that you do have a presence within their world. So that's an important thing to talk about. And then I think a big, 
big thing that a lot of people have and are worried about is a lot of people view MPs as this kind of celebrity status because they do make decision making because they have decision making power in Canada. But I really, really want to reiterate the importance um, of responding to tough questions because although we all have diverse opinions and beliefs, we're not always going to agree on every single thing. And so you, if you are given a tough question in an MP meeting, I think these are just five different ways to make sure that you continue to have a great relationship unless you feel so strongly that you can't have a relationship, which is fine as well. So always be humble and respectful. If you don't know the answer to a question, don't worry. Let them know that you'll follow up once you've done research. Stay, thought, stay positive and focus on your messaging. You have done research before the meeting, so you should kind of have an understanding of what the MP probably leans towards versus what they don't necessarily care for. And you always want to stick to the facts from trusted sources. If you have really good research, make sure you're staying to that. And then if you're at a point where you definitely can't, um, you definitely feel like you're stuck, try to move the conversation back to middle ground. So maybe talk about your community, talk about your constituency, kind of gauge it so you're back on in middle ground and you can kind of con start the conversation again. And so I'm asking everybody to do this activity. I think it's a great way to kind of put in your mind the importance um, of knowing this messaging ahead of time. And it also kind of speaks to why you're passionate. And so if everybody's comfortable, I would ask that you answer this question in the chat box. So why should we spend more money internationally when we have poverty and financial difficulties still in Canada? So if you are comfortable, I think this is a really good exercise because it starts to make you think of some of these questions and then it's in your brain. So if you're ever asked this question, you can answer it relatively quickly. And so we're just gonna leave about two minutes um, to put. I'm going to actually put the question, if someone could Put the question in the chat for me so it's there and then you guys can answer and think about it um, further and then post in the chat if ready. I am going to move forward though because uh, our MP guests will be joining in about 10 minutes and I want to make sure I cover just a couple more things but I really hope that you still think this through and are posting in the chat because it's a really great way again to kind of think through those questions. So just some minor things that I think that it's really important to always remember is that MPs work for you. Essentially, these are elected officials that are supposed to show, like, support their community needs, make policies that will help benefit. Um, I know it's not always seen like that in the light and there are controversies that happen, but they do ultimately work for you. So you always need to remember that you do have power in this relationship. You also, like I said, don't need to know all the answers. You can follow up, don't let it throw you off. And any action is a starting point with MP engagement. Even today, having everybody research their MPs, that is a starting point, because now you know a little bit more about them and it'll start off your engagement. So just to note that there. Okay, lobbying. So lobbying is a really important part of parliamentary engagement. Um, it can be confusing and I'm not an expert. So if you have any questions that I can't answer, please go to this link below. It's got really great plain information. And so first I just want to briefly explain what lobbying does not include. So any oral or written submissions to a parliamentary committee or proceeding that is a matter of public record, because it's public record, anybody can see it. So the transparency is there so people know what everyone is saying. Um, if you're exchanging about uh, the enforcement of a new law or you're trying to understand an interpretation or have somebody apply the law, if a new regulation comes out and you don't necessarily understand it, you can ask all of these questions to your MPs and those in government because it's their job to explain it to you. And so that does not count as lobbying. If you're requesting more information on any of the things I just mentioned, so enforcement, interpretation, or application, that does not count as lobbying. Um, corporations and organizations that are not exceeding the 20-80% threshold. So if your organization is not doing more than 20% of engagement, you don't necessarily need to record it in the lobby registry. Volunteers don't need to. Um, if you're a citizen communicating on your behalf, you don't need to. And it, or if you're an official in, an, in another government, you don't need to. So I see people posting in the chat and I'm so glad you're doing it because it's, it's just a great activity to kind of think through. And it's also really wonderful to read everybody else's because it could even help you think through why you're passionate. 
So just quickly and briefly, lobbying mostly includes um, if, you, if there's an impayment by an employer or a client going on that is under the purview of the federal government, you would definitely have to register that. Um, if you're communicating directly or indirectly with a federal public office holder, you're technically supposed to put that on the lobby registry if it doesn't fit any of the things I mentioned before. Um, again, if you have questions, call the lobby registry. They're pretty great and they um, will answer your questions very quickly. Uh, if you're confused by what I said about a public office holder, you can, there's also a database so you can see if the person you engaged with is considered a public office holder. And again, if you're trying to uh, sway or convince or change um, a legislative proposal, a bill, a new re resolution or regulation, or are imp inputting on a policy or a program, you do need to record that as on your lobby registry. So hopefully that helps you kind of understand. I know lobbying has a negative connotation and Robin has explained several times how it's more of advocacy and I wanna just make that very clear. I personally am very happy to do lobbying and advocacy because I know that the stuff that we're working on at Results will help lead to a better and more positive world. And so I'm happy to be doing that type of work. So very super exciting news and I'm so excited. I was hoping that we would have time to fit this in, but this is gonna be a quick case study on our immunization campaign. I'm so excited to say that on Wednesday, the Prime Minister and the Minister of International Development, Karina Gold, announced ambitious pledges towards Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, and the Global Eradicate Polio Eradication Initiative. So this was a huge win for results because we have been working on this for the past six months. Our volunteers and staff have been trying to advocate for the government to donate money, or to give money, not necessarily donate, to these causes because they will help vaccinate children and save so many lives. And so we're so happy that this happened. And we wanna thank everybody who was involved with this because it was a huge effort. And so based on this vaccine's work, I just wanted to show you in kind of like a cluster of photos what the parliamentary engagement for results has been for this campaign, both with staff and with volunteers. And so we have all these pictures in the screen. So right in the middle here, we have Rochelle who spoke in the first volunteer or the first advocacy webinar and she's one of our great volunteers. And so she, here she is with her MP and so she's having a meeting with him, talking about how great vaccines are and the importance of them in saving lives and preventing deaths. And so that is one of the ways we advocate. Another way, if you see this picture to the left of Rochelle, this is Kenneth and I with an expert from Geneva who is an expert in polio. And she, she is able to speak to things to the MP that necessarily Kenneth and I don't have all the knowledge in because she's an expert on the topic. Another thing we like to do whenever we can is to find people with lived experience who are advocates and trying to share their story. And so below here under Rochelle, we have polio survivor Safia Ibrahim, and she is also a polio advocate at UNICEF. And so we were able to have some meetings so she can speak to her personal lived experience of having polio. And polio does have a vaccine and it is preventable now with the vaccine. So it was really important to kind of have that lived experience. While all of these meetings are going on, our volunteers are also taking other actions. So they're on social media. In this tweet, you can see that our volunteer tagged both the minister and her local MP. We also did a Twitter chat. So we were trending with the vaccines work hashtag and the vaccines for results hashtag. So that was a great way to kind of build up a presence online, which MPs notice about. Uh, we also have LTs and opt-its coming in. So that's a great way we create visuals to again, make that online presence to show different ways and to all be connected. Um, again, we do with the staff in this bottom corner, this was an event we had with um, an education working group. And so here we have the three critics for international development and a liberal MP who was co-chairing. And so Mike Lake, MP Mike Lake, the conservative, actually called out GPI and Gavi in this conversation. So that was really great. At the top here, we have our lovely campaigns manager, Taryn, and she's actually having a conversation with Minister Gold. And so it's these soft touch points. When you meet them, have a chat, get them to know you, know your face, understand what you're doing. Uh, and while that's going on, I also am in the background just reaching out to MPs who have identified themselves as champions for issues, 
And so one of the other things we were doing that was a little bit of a softer engagement was asking that those MPs send a letter saying that they support pledges to both Gabby and GPI. So this is a conservative MP who sent a letter to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Finally, one of the great things results has the capacity for is we're able to take MPs on delegation. Obviously COVID will restrict some of that travel, but here we have conservative MP Lynn Rood and liberal MP Marwin Tabara. And this past January, we were actually able to take them to Tanzania. And this is really important because it allows them to see aid on the ground and in real time. And then so after we have MP Marwin Tabara making a statement in the House of Commons for International Development Week, and we collaborated with him on that statement, and he was able to also bring to the House the importance of GPI and Gabby. And so, so those are some of the ways that we're able to do uh, some parliamentary engagement, but this is also uh, happening with all of the other stuff our organization does that's also advocacy. So working in working groups, reaching out and having volunteer sessions, the volunteers are doing their own meetings. So it's really important that you see everything as a whole because all of these actions together are what ultimately helped actually get this uh, financial pledge, which is what we're really excited to have. So just quickly, politics matter, but so do you. I just wanna make sure everybody realized that we are lucky to be able to participate in a democracy. And so if you wanna see the sustainable development goals happen, we have to support and as a community and as a country, make sure that we're out supporting uh, those who we think will help lead to that change. So I'm actually- Hey, I'm about to speak. Yeah, I'm passing it oh, on to- <laughs> it on to our executive director, Chris Dendies, and she will introduce our guest parliamentarian. I get, I apologize. I was speaking to my son in the kitchen because I've been on mute and suddenly you're making popcorn. Okay, sorry about that. Hello, everybody. I'm really thrilled to be able to introduce uh, Heather McPherson, the member of parliament for Edmonton Strathcona. Heather is the critic for international development for the NDP, as, as Lindsay was saying, a really active and incredibly engaged champion on Parliament Hill. Um, you know, we've got to know her professionally and personally, and she's just an amazing sort of champion for the issues that many of you I know care about in terms of social justice and international development. Uh, and I just want to acknowledge she's leaving the COVID-19 committee to join this call. So her time is limited, so we'll make the most of it. But um, Heather, thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, so I have just uh, three questions, but I'll start with the first. So, so Heather, just how is parliamentary engagement and advocacy in your view, or how has it changed since COVID-19? It's, it's so fascinating to me. Um, well, first of all, thanks very much for letting me join you today. This is, this is great, and thanks for the kind introduction. I did just step away from our, our Committee of the Whole, but I'll pop back in um, when, I'm, when I'm done chatting with you guys. Um, a couple things I should say to start with. The first thing is, is for me, I only became a parliamentarian for the first time in October. So in October, um, you know, we got sworn in in November, we, we had a bit of a break and then came back to what has been a pretty remarkable set of months since then. It has, we haven't had a normal, so I don't have a lot of understanding of what the normal looked like um, from, from this side of the table, I guess. Um, one of the things that I did want to talk about, it, and I know there's a few different questions, is things that, that you can do to um, punch through, I guess, during COVID-19. So the first thing that's very obvious, and I'm sure you've talked about, is the fact that you can't meet people in person. That's not possible. Um, so you do need to find those ways to use the digital platforms. You do need to find those ways to interact with parliamentarians, with um, your stakeholders, with your supporters, that's different than what we've done in the past. And, and I think we've seen some people have done this really well and some people you know, haven't done it quite so well. One of the things that I think is important right now is, is recognizing that, that people are at home. People are, are anxious for connection, they are at home, they are, they are um, available a little bit more than they might have been normally. So that's something to take advantage of. Um, but in terms of advocating during COVID-19, really it's finding that space for, for parliamentarians to help you. Um, it's finding, um, being able to, to get the attention because right now we are all running full tilt, trying to support our constituents, trying to do what we need to do in terms of our critic roles. 
and and you know we're really overwhelmed with the number of requests that are coming in the number of things that we're getting so it's it's trying to find that space i think is one of the big things chris do you want me to keep going or do you have some yeah no i i no please i i I, I guess it's just, I agree. We've had some volunteers who have been able to sort of secure some meetings, like a Zoom meeting and I think a phone meeting, and, and that's been just very generous of MP's times. But can you share some, you know, inside tips and tricks? There's some on the call who are really new to parliamentary advocacy, so we just want them to break through yeah. being concerned and be brave. But if you have any insider tips, that might be helpful too. Well, and it's, it's fascinating for me, and I know we've talked about this, Chris, but the idea that I spent a lot of my career trying to advocate to government and then, um, you know, within the last six months, I have now become a parliamentarian myself. I see all those mistakes that I made when I was trying to advocate. Um, one thing that I think is really key, it's really important for, for people to understand, is parliamentarians want to help the communities that they're, they're fighting for. We, we want to be your ally. We want to help you. Uh, we have some constraints. Um, what, the key one right now, like I mentioned, is time. Uh, so make our jobs easier. Um, there's a few things you can do. If you have a meeting with a parliamentarian, if you have a meeting with a minister, if you have a meeting with a critic, um, if you have a clear ask of what you'd like us to do for you, that makes things so much easier for us. Um, and, and maybe just even a little bit of background information about what we can do. Um, you know, we, we, can, we can reach out directly to ministers. We, can, we have the, the potential to sponsor petitions. We can put order questions forward. Um, you know, I can have a quiet conversation with the minister. I can write a formal letter that becomes public. I can do a press release. There are things that we have. There are certain tools that we can, we can use uh, so if you know a little bit more about what those are and what you'd like us to do, that, that goes a long way. Um, recognizing that there's two things that I'd, I'd follow up with that with. One is, I remember always going into ministers or critics offices with reams of paper, like this is the super impressive report we wrote. This is our annual report. Uh, this is our this is our fancy, you know, document that we've created for this particular issue. A lot of that nobody is reading. It, it's just it we just don't have the time to do that. So it needs to be concise. I'm I probably not going to read a you know a five or six page email. Um, but I, but I will, and I, and my staff will read um, information that is um, really, really concise. It has a clear ask, uh, you know, that that aligns with what we need to do. That's that's important. Um, and then the other thing I would say too is that you you need to place your ask within the current context, and and you need to read the room, I guess, a little bit. So right now. Everything is about is about COVID nineteen. Everything is about how we're dealing with our current current crisis. Now, that's not to say we can't talk about things like international development or sustainable development or um, you know a whole range of different issues. It's just that we need to put it into that context. So we should be um, tailoring your you, you know you should be tailoring your message. So if you're talking about international development efforts, for example. Um, make sure you're using the language that everybody understands. Make sure you are talking about how uh, when, when we have a global pandemic, we need a global response or how, you know, Canada has these obligations because when the world is healthier, Canadians um, are safer. If you can frame it that way, I think that's great. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind, I, I spent a lot of my career working in the field of international development. I know what the sustainable development goals are. I've advocated on behalf of a lot of these issues. Many of our parliamentarians don't know what those things are. So, for example, I've a couple times brought up the need to increase ODA in, in our caucus meetings, and most of our caucus don't know what ODA is. So, I, you know, you have to restart with some of, the, some of that language. Um, sustainable development goals are very, very important to, to me and very important to many parliamentarians, but many of them don't even know what they are. Just, just a, a few tips, I guess, that I would put forward, Chris. No, that's, those are brilliant tips. And I also would say probably your perspective on people speaking with passion and with their own voice and just because they care, that, that probably resonates as well, right? In terms mm. of storytelling and all of those pieces. I guess just the, the last thing is, 
you know, you've got dozens of people on this call who are taking, uh, who are appreciative of your time. Do you have any, do you have any final pieces of advice or, or just even thoughts on why it's just so critical and important for the public to engage with their parliamentarians? I, I do, yeah. The, the first thing I, the first point I would make is that there is systems that you can use. And so, for example, I would highly recommend that you are, all, that, that the sector is working together to amplify messages. So it's, it's vitally important that you're using organizations like the provincial and regional councils, the intercouncil network, CCI, CCANWatch, whatever those, those umbrellas results, whatever those umbrellas are, um, that you can, you can convene um, conversations together. So that, you know, if I'm hearing from 10 different groups on 10 different things, it, it's much harder for me to take action on those. I, I, you know, it's, again, it's a time thing. It's, it's where you can move that. Um, however, if, if I'm hearing the same message from, you know, Change for Children and Oxfam and results and plan, and, and this is something that this sector is asking for, it's much easier for us to move that forward. Um, it's also much easier for me to then go to my other colleagues, whether they be um, conservative or, or block or, or liberals, and, and start to build some coalitions of parliamentarians to move to move items forward. I think that's also really important. Um, and, and the final thing, and I know this has happened in our sector a lot, or in, I guess in your sector a lot, um, when you do the asks, they need to be quite, they, there, there does need to be that specificity. Um, and one of the things as I was getting ready for this call, I was thinking about is I was reflecting on um, the, the ICN, CCIC results, a number of different organizations did a program, um, an advocacy um, campaign several years ago called Reverse the Cuts. And it, the whole campaign was about reversing cuts to ODA. Right, it was, a perfect, it was a perfect campaign in that way. However, we weren't very clear about asking for the ODA to be used better. So I think that's something to keep in mind as we come out of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we know that there are people ar across the country, around the world, looking at what a post-COVID-19 recovery looks like. Um, we're going to hear a lot of rhetoric about austerity. We're gonna hear a lot of rhetoric about, um, you know, pulling up our, tightening our belts and, and you know, paying down the deficit. We're also going to hear a lot of um, opportunities, I think, going forward and what the world should look like and how, how COVID-19 has made inequality um, quite, quite stark. We can see where, the, where our society hasn't been protecting those vulnerable people. Um, so I think that's an opportunity for, our, for the, the sector as well to, to start talking about what you'd like to see coming out of COVID-19 and how Canada's role in the world is vital, and it is vital we don't lose our, um, lose our way. But it's also vital that we support our Canadian organizations, that we support you know, CSOs that are working on the ground, that have deep commitments to their partners, uh, long relationships with their partners. Um, otherwise, I have a fear that we will see a massive amount of our ODA go directly to multilaterals, go directly bilateral, and, and skip that, that vital piece of, of engaging Canadians. Heather, thank you so much for that. I think that's, you know, as always, wise, smart reflections. I just, I know you've got to go in like literally a minute or two. I'm just seeing if there's any questions in the chat from, from any of our participants. Sorry. I do know I talk too much, sorry. No, you were fabulous. Go ahead, no. Lance. Sorry, I just wanted to also, Heather, if you're comfortable and everybody, it would be great if we could try to do some screenshots of a photo just to show everybody involved. And so maybe before MP McPherson leaves, uh, if you could turn your camera on and we'll try to take a screenshot. So we'll see if we have any questions. And then of course, MP McPherson, when you have to go, just let us know. Sure. Okay, so Gertrude, I think, had a question. Hi, um, thank you so much for your time. I was wondering, what would you advise lay people, like a lot of the people in this, to support our um, MPs or to support the organizations that we are affiliated with to um, um, continue to support the, the international development funding for, for services? What would you suggest we do? Um, 
So there's lots of things that as an individual you can do. One of those things is that as an individual, reaching out to the MP in your particular riding is really important. And, and it's probably not likely, uh, knowing that there are 338 MPs, that that, that MP has a, has a role to play in terms of a critic role or a minister role in international development. But you can flag that and you can ask them to share it with their caucus. So that's one thing is that we know that if more parliamentarians are hearing um, that, that this is an issue that matters to Canadians, more parliamentarians will care. And frankly, there's, we're in a situation right now where we need to, we need to punch some space through um, within the current government because while we hear a lot of the right things from this current government, we haven't seen a movement in our ODA yet. We haven't seen, you know, there are some things we need to do a little bit better there. Um, but we've also still got a uh, opposition party that is, that is uh, their policy is a 35% cut to international development. And that policy needs to change. And as soon as, you know, so if you do, for example, have a conservative member of parliament, that's, that's really powerful because it's, if you can tell them that that is a bad policy and that as a Canadian, you want to see that policy removed from their platform, that goes a long way as well. Thank you so much. That's a okay. great question. I think uh, Shailen gets the final word. She, uh, she wanted to thank you in saying that being Algonquin and Caribou clan, that she really <laughs> likes the painting behind you. I have to be careful though, because if you're if I'm not careful, I get horns, so I have to sit a certain <laughs> way, or it doesn't it doesn't do me any good. <laughs> Heather, thank you very, very much for joining us and for being inspiring, for being a champion, taking time out of the, the committee to kind of join this group of citizens. And I think your even being here and doing that reinforces the message we're trying to deliver to this group is that um, MPs are there and they're ready and willing to listen to you and you just have to kind of knock on the door and go in. Like exactly. really, that's the first yeah. step. So. Well, and please, everybody reach out to me and, and send me an email, send me emails. Uh, it's, it's something that we want to, we want to make sure we're still working with all of the communities, even during this really challenging time. And it's nice to see you all on Zoom, but stay safe and yeah, stay healthy. Every, if everyone can just vote for a picture, smile, and we'll try to do a picture quickly. I know Henia is going to be doing it, so. Okay, I think she got it. Thank you, everyone, so much. And thank, thank you. you. Thank you. We have a lot on Zoom these days. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me just share my screen. I hope that MP McPherson was able to give you guys some inspiration. She's a wonderful advocate and has great experience. So I'm just going to share my screen again. Okay, can everybody see that? Okay. So obviously we just had some questions, so I'm going to move on. So I just want to make sneak peek for next week. So we are going to be doing advocacy in the digital age, which we've seen is going to be very important, especially within COVID-19. So you don't want to miss that. Register if you haven't already. Uh, tonight for homework, I'm asking you all to reflect on one of three issues that you personally want to see positive change for. Identify what level of government addresses your issue. And just think about and brainstorm a way to build a strategy. If you are comfortable and confident, which I hope you are, and I hope this webinar helped you become more, uh, reach out and like Heather said, send an email, uh, maybe follow them on Twitter, attempt on Twitter to kind of engage with them, give them a phone call. Any step, like I said, is a starting point. And so it's really important to engage. I'm gonna hand it over to Lisa right now, who's gonna be discussing some of the homework for next week. Thank you. Yeah, that was that was awesome. So I uh, I hope you can join us next week when we'll be talking about um, advocacy in the digital age. So some homework that you can do in the week leading up to the webinar next Wednesday, uh, no, sorry, next Thursday at noon um, is to number one, make sure that you have at least one social media account and ideally uh, Twitter because we're going to be doing a practical session uh on on social media to get you all used to engaging uh digitally so that would be great if you could uh, if you could sign up and um if you're not already on twitter create an account and be logged on to your computer or laptop uh, not your smartphone for twitter because uh we'll have something practical that we could do right away um and so it'll be easier if it's on your computer or laptop 
um, and have and be already logged in for the start of the webinar next week. So now that you know who your MP is, look them up and start following them on Twitter and that will help facilitate the session uh, for next week. So thanks for, for um, considering that and uh, getting prepared. Awesome, thank you so much, Lisa. And so there is some questions that are coming through right now. Uh, so my email is here if anybody has additional questions. I know someone was saying to bounce ideas off for an MP email. I am happy to take that on, so make sure you can reach out. Uh, another question shows that if your research shows your MP is not engaged, particularly with interdevelopment matters, is it worthwhile? I think it's always worthwhile to reach out because again, if you're building a movement and you have other members in your community who are thinking the same way or passionate about the same issue, they'll start to notice that people are caring. And because you're the voter base and their constituency, they have to kind of heed your advice in a certain extent. And so it's really important to engage with your MP, especially on international development members, because as I mentioned previously, that is the international mandate. Your MLA might be a great um, influencer who can help target your MP, or maybe they have a relationship with them. Um, although the governments do talk often, the MPPs and the MPs, uh, I don't think they hang out all the time. So it is just to notice that you might have to frame some of your messaging differently there. Yeah, definitely send MP McPherson some emails. I'm sure she'll love to hear them. And again, our the Results Canada website has very good tips on how to get a meeting, uh, different ways if you do get a meeting, what you should do, how to write letters and op-eds, and how to engage. So make sure you check out our website for your tools because there's a lot of great resources there to help you along. Uh, I think that's about time. If anybody has any questions, put them in the chat. If not, reach out. Uh, hope you learned so much and I'm so excited for next week's webinar.